Thank you, Art, for leading us in that time of prayer. And for everyone who is new to here today, we are in the middle of a series called Bible Classics. Now, growing up, and I'm, I'm sure your families are similar to mine, there, there is a certain language you use in the home. And I'm, I'm not talking about bad language. I'm talking about a vocabulary you develop through common experiences. And in my family, it was, a, it was quotes from movies or books. Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Narnia. You know, you would have all of these quotes and would use them all the time, and you knew what each other was talking about because you had those common experiences. And that actually was pretty common in the church. You know, when most people went to church, right, if you were talking about Daniel in the lion's den, David and Goliath, Noah's Ark, um, the fall of humanity in Genesis 3, right, you had a common vocabulary that you could bet most people understood what you were talking about. And so you were able to use those references in conversation. But that's not the case anymore. Most people are not church. Most people do not have an understanding of God's Word. And even in churches, many people are biblically illiterate. Right? They're not reading it on their own. They might not be familiar with these church stories. And so this series is to remedy that. It's to go through the Old Testament, to look at these core stories, right? And most importantly of all, not just to learn these cool stories, though that's fun, but to see Christ in them. And because you have an Old Testament nerd as a pastor, I especially love to deal with those stories. But that's the heart of what we're seeing. And today we're looking at Genesis 22. And we're looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac. You know, the, the kind of the, where we've been heading as a church, we've been looking at the fall of humanity in Genesis 3. Then we see Noah's Ark. We see the cataclysm poured on humanity for their sin. Last, uh, last week, I believe, we were looking at the Tower of Babel. The confusion of humanity. Humanity dispersed all over. And now we're looking at Abraham. Now Abraham is a key figure in the Bible. He is the, the father of the faith, really. He is the, the kind of the father of the Jews, especially. Because he is really the first guy that God really established his covenant with. Now God did have a covenant with Noah. But there is a level of intimacy, there's a level of knowledge, there's a level of depth that Abraham had with God that no one had had prior to this. And God had promised Abraham something. You know, Abraham followed God, he left his homeland, but Abraham had a problem. He couldn't have children. Him and his wife were barren. But God had promised him something. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a child. That was the promise. And in Genesis 22, we see that promise has come. He has a son. He has Isaac. But now God asks him to do something. And it's something extremely troubling to most of us. He says, I want you to sacrifice him. Now, in the 21st century, we might think, what? Like child sacrifice in the Bible? You know, is this another kind of text used against us as Christians to show that our faith is outdated, crazy, shouldn't be taken at face value. But there is so much to this that we miss because we don't understand the Old Testament, because we don't understand the culture. There's so much here. And in fact, what we see in this text that's going to be the focus for today is this text really shows us something about God. That God is not like other gods. That God, though he is a God who does deserve sacrifice, he provides the sacrifice for us. And he now brings us to a place of blessing. But that initial part, that sacrifice, and especially as we see today, testing can be challenging for us. Who here likes tests? Maybe there's like one person who loved tests in school. Most people don't like tests, right? When you're growing up in school and you got math tests and you had to have exams, most people don't enjoy it. And we have a hard problem with this idea that God tests us, right? And he's not giving us Bible quizzes, but he does test us, but he does it for a very specific reason. And we're going to look at that today. And so as we look at Genesis 2, as we look at the story of Abraham and Isaac, this story reveals a significant aspect of your relationship with God, his work in your life, his testing of you. This story reveals to us the reality of testing the reasons for testing, and what can result in your life specifically from testing. And my hope is that you move from a place of sacrifice to blessing, just like God did with Abraham. 
So let's read together then. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. If you have your Bibles with you, if you have a, a cell phone and have the Bible app, please open that up to Genesis 2, 1 to 18. And if you don't have any of those things, a phone or the Bible, we have the text up on the screen, but it's always better to have it in front of you yourself. So Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. And we're going to read from there together. And it reads this, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his, Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns, by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this. And have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. All right, so we see this story. We see Abraham taking his son Isaac, about to sacrifice him. But God intervenes at the last moment, stops him, and provides the sacrifice. So what can we learn from this story? Well, apart from not sacrificing our children, what should we learn from this? And the first thing we learn is this, the reality of testing, that God tests us. This whole story is really about testing. Because it says in verse 1, right, like the very beginning of this story, it says, after these things, God tested Abraham. It, it tells us this is about testing. God came to test Abraham, and be assured he comes to test you as well. And as I said previously, most of us do not enjoy this. We don't like tests. We have negative experiences with tests. And so we might have a hard time with the concept that God seeks to test us. But God never tests us to undermine you or to hurt you, to get you to fail. God lovingly tests you to strengthen you. And what exactly does God test when he tests you? And I'd, I'd like our, our answer to be grounded in Abraham's story. And actually, in, in Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, it talks about the story of Abraham. It reads, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would la later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, at his, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. God invited Abraham and God called Abraham into a relationship of faith 
where God would be the center. That God would be the center of it. God would be the foundation of Abraham's life. And think about it, right? In the stories we have looked at from now until here, God really has not been the center of life for humanity, right? When you look at the fall, when you look at Noah's Ark, when you look at the Tower of Babel, God is just not even, God's not even thought about. He's an afterthought. But now God reveals himself more to humanity. He invites Abraham on this journey with him. And he reveals that God needs to be at the center of his life, not other things. Abraham left everything to follow God. Everything. He left his homeland. He left his people. He left his culture to embrace God as the center. God became the source of his salvation, his significance, his security. God became everything. And as a follower of Jesus, you have been asked to go on the same journey Abraham did. To follow Jesus. To leave everything behind. To turn away from former practices and things. To put Jesus at the center of your life. The center of your salvation, your significance, your security. And it's this faith commitment, right? That's the commitment and promise between us and God. That God tests. He tests that commitment. Have we really made him our salvation? Have we really made him the center of our lives? Have we really made him our significance and security? In 1 Peter 1, 6-7, it reads this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor where Jesus Christ is revealed. And in Hebrews 12, 6, we're told that God disciplines those he loves. So God tests Abraham because he loves him. He wants to strengthen that faith commitment. And God tests us for the same reason. He wants to test. He wants to strengthen that faith commitment between us and God. And notice the nature of the test, right? What does God test? And we're, we give that this is clear in the threefold repetition, right? Your son, your only son, the son whom you love. God says it in this way, not to rub it in, right? That, oh, I'm taking away this thing you love. It's to expose something in Abraham, right? Remember, God needs to be the center of salvation. God needs to be the center of security. God needs to be the center of significance. Isaac became Abraham's only social hope. Again, his only son, to establish his 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 family through him. And in chapter 21, Abraham sent away his um, other son, Ishmael. He slept with his servant. He had Ishmael. He sent him away. And now Isaac was the only son he had left, the only son he could build a family through. Isaac was the only hope for his family, the only hope. Isaac had become Abraham's social center. He became everything. Isaac became the main source of love and joy in his life. And I think more than this, right? Isaac became his salvation. In that time, because again, we're mortal, we all die, in order to establish your family, you had to have a, a son, especially a firstborn son, in which he would take over everything. He would take over the family business, per se. And so if you did not have that, you were lost, right? That was like the worst thing that could happen in that time. The reason God is testing Abraham and the reason God tests you is because like Abraham, we can often put our salvation, security, and significance on false foundations. And here's where things get you know, dangerous for us. Often we put our foundations on good things. Like, is a child a good thing? Like, absolutely they are. Is a job you love a good thing? Of course. Relationships, um, being financially in a good place, are, are those bad things? Of course not but they're good things that can easily become ultimate things. And therein lies the danger. When we come to Jesus, we make him the center and foundation of our life, making him alone our salvation, our security and significance. But in practice, right, we can often have other things we look to. But and These are what we call functional foundations. Right? Things we look to other than Jesus to give, our, give us significance, security, salvation. And we look to relationships, we look to jobs, we, we look to looks, or, you know, being attractive, material things. Each and every one of us has different things that we may look to. 
right? But believe it, you have something you look to. So how do you know God has put his hand, God is testing something in your life that you've made a functional foundation? And it's actually pretty easy. It feels like God is killing you. It feels terrible, right? If you didn't care about it, it's probably not a functional foundation. But if this is devastating to you, if you feel like you've lost your identity, then this shows that this is something you have put as a foundation in your life that you're now building on, right? And I know God has tested me in some of these foundations. And every single time, it feels like God's killing you, right? It feels like God's taking away the best thing in your life. And God put his hand on this major foundation in Abraham's life, which was his son. And this appears very cruel of God on the surface, right? Like, why on earth would God do that with someone's kid? But think about it like this. Everything you have in life will ultimately be taken away from you. Everything you have, right? Your looks, your job, your finances, your body, right? All of that will be stripped away. And there is only one thing at the end of the day which ultimately matters, right? And that's your relationship with God. And, and we have to understand this, right? Because before Genesis 22, we see constantly that to have a relationship with God is life. What, 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 what were the two trees in the center of the Garden of Eden, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's the other tree we often miss out on, that we often don't talk about? Anyone? The tree of life. Good job, Chris. Good job. You got that. The tree of life, right? And now what is the tree of life, right? Because the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden, and we also see it's in the new heaven and the new earth, right? In Revelation, we see it's at the center of the new Jerusalem, right? So what is this tree of life? And we also see, again, the, the kind of the metaphors of the tree of life, of the branch of life, right? Which is what Jesus has called. It's all throughout the Bible, right? What it means, what the tree of life is, is that proximity to God is life, right? What happened to humanity when we're kicked out of the Garden of Eden? when we're not near the tree of life anymore. We die, right? We need to be in proximity to God. We need to be in relationship with God to live. That is life, right? That's why it, eternal life is a relationship with God, right? And we see Jesus is called the branch of life, right? That tree of life metaphors is used about Jesus, right? And so what God was doing here was loving. Because if Abraham moves away from God, if Abraham focuses all his attention on his son and his own lineages and his family, he will ultimately die. And not just a mortal death, an eternal death, because he has been separated from the tree of life, which is a relationship with God. And that's what God does in us, right? He wants us to get back on him, to put him at the center, because that brings us to life, right? And that kind of... It helps us understand that what God is doing is not cruel. What God is doing is incredibly loving. Because to do nothing would mean that those people, that Abraham, would move away from him and would ultimately die. And this is a brutal test for Abraham. Because Isaac was that foundation. But it's more brutal than we know. right? It's not just his son who he loves. The key is what this test was all about. Right? In ancient Near Eastern cultures, they were not individualistic like we are. They were all about the family. They thought corporately in terms of the family, right? Your hopes and dreams and a future was not just individual. It was all wrapped up in family success. And during that time, there was something called the law of the primal genitor, which means the firstborn got all of the wealth. He got it all so that the family would remain centralized and strong. And all ancient cultures looked at the firstborn child as their hope, as their future. And as well, God laid down kind of a symbolic structure based on the firstborn to say something that all ancient cultures could understand. God says over and over again that the life of the firstborn belongs to him. He says this of cattle. He says this of grain. He says this of children. Think of God's judgment in Egypt in the book of Exodus, right? You know, the, the curse of the firstborn child, where the angel of the Lord comes through and the firstborn child is slain. So what does this mean, right? The ancients understood something that we often miss out. And what they understood is this, that when God says the life of the firstborn belongs to him, God is saying this, that we all have a debt to sin. That all of us are in debt, right? Every single one of us are in debt. 
And God is saying that every family, every person, every human being owes this debt of sin. And while you don't see this or get this at times, Abraham understood this. He understood his sin. He understood his debt towards God. And he knew, Abraham knew, that God was a God of justice, of holiness, and that there was a debt of sin every family owed. And it's God's way of saying no one and no family is righteous. Everyone is guilty of sin. Everyone is shoulder to shoulder in their sin. And so when God commands Abraham to sacrifice his firstborn son, Abraham knew that God is calling his debt. Right? It's like the bank calling you and saying, okay, we need your debt, we need your money. Judgment was falling on Abraham's home. And he knew that God was in the right. He knew that God was just. He knew that God was fair in executing his judgment. Right? God doesn't, Abraham doesn't say, but God, you know, this isn't fair, God. Why? He understands his debt. And in fact, all of us kind of understand this to some extent, right? Though we're all aghast at the idea of giving up our children, all of us say things like this, right? And think about yourself. I need to give God more of my time. I need to read my Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to give God more of my focus. I need to give God more of me. I need to give up this and focus more on that for God, right? And these are all sacrifices, right? Those are all sacrifices. They're all offerings we're giving God, all as an attempt to ease our burden of debt, of sin debt before God, right? To make us feel like we're in better standing before God. They just fit in more with our culture at the time, right? So we all understand those things. And Abraham understood it too. He had put his hope in his son because his son was the son of promise. But God reminds Abraham of another reality, and that is the reality of the, sin, of the debt of sin that he owes. So Abraham kind of has these two things he has to reason out, right? First, God has promised me that through my son, through my family, I will be blessed. But God is also calling Abraham's debt, right? So how do we reconcile those two things, right? The promises of God and the debt of sin that he owes. Because God's just, right? God's holy. He requires payment. He requires sacrifice. He requires offering. But he's, almost, he's always promised us these things too, right? So how do we reconcile them? A God of holiness, a God of justice, and a God of grace and promise. And the key to the narrative is verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. So the key here is in verse 6, right? Abraham takes the wood and he places it on his son. And notice, Abraham takes all the dangerous things, right? He takes the knife, he takes the fire. Notice the tenderness and care in which he treats his son, right? And as they're ascending up this mountain, Isaac asks, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And notice what Abraham answers, right? And he's not just lying to his son. He's saying God himself will provide. We can only imagine the heartache that Abraham had at this moment, right? Knowing what was going to happen. But do you see what pushed him up that mountain? What got him to follow through? He didn't say, I can do this. God's going to bless my obedience. God will accept my record. He didn't say that. What pushed him up the mountain was the strong belief and trust that God would provide for him, that God would provide. I don't know how God will keep his promise. I have no idea how he's going to reconcile these two things. I just know that he will. God will find a way. God will provide for me. And Abraham now knows that this hope can't be Isaac alone. Isaac alone can't be his hope because of the debt of sin that's rightfully owed to God. So he renews his hope in God. He knows that what drives him and pushes him up the mountain is the belief that God will provide. God will find a way. So why does God do this? Why does he make Abraham go through this horrific test? And he does it to refine and to renew his faith. And I think also to reveal to him the greatest thing that will happen in the whole universe, in the whole history of mankind. To take his eyes off of Isaac and to put his eyes onto God. Isaac can't be the answer because of the debt of sin. Abraham knows he can't resolve this, the debt of sin that he owes God, but he knows that God will look after it. And do you notice that before he sacrifices his son, who stops him, right? The angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord says this, Now I know you fear God, right? 
And this word fear is often misleading, right? Because we don't use that word in a very positive way, right? To be scared of something, to fear something, that's, all, that's always in the negative, right? And the word fear in the Bible means to be, uh, to be overwhelmed and controlled by something. In relation to God, it means to be overwhelmed and controlled by God's greatness and goodness. In Proverbs 28, it's that word fear is linked with joy. And in Psalm 130, it's linked with forgiveness as well, right? So fear is, a, is often a positive thing in the Bible. True fear is to be amazed at God's greatness and goodness for his love and grace. What drove Abraham up the mountain and what drives us to overcome these false foundations we have is our belief that God's testing and our relationship with God is, an, is amazing love and full of grace that God will provide. And often we read this story thinking that the main focus is that Abraham, he's a man of faith, he obeyed God, and we just need to be more like Abraham. And if that was true, Abraham would have named the mountain after, after himself, right? He would have named the mountain the place I obeyed. But notice that the main thing revealed here has nothing to do with Abraham and everything to do with God, right? The thing memorialized in the name of the mountain itself is what God revealed and what God shows about himself, that God is the provider God. The key and main reason for God testing you is not to reveal something about you, but to reveal something about him. God tests you to show something about his person and his nature that will strengthen your faith foundation and change your life. And that is this, that God provides. That God requires a sacrifice, and he himself will provide it. And what's amazing about this story, and notice this, the irony is that this mountain is called the place where God provides. And do you know that the mountains of Moriah actually surround Jerusalem? And that years later, another son would go up that mountain. Another son would have wood placed on his back going up that mountain, that another son would be led by his father, would be put on a wooden cross, and that his, this father would do what only Abraham was tested to do, and that is to sacrifice his son. You see, the son in this story, the sacrifice in this story has nothing to do with Abraham and has everything to do with Jesus. That what God was revealing to Abraham here was that he was going to provide a sacrifice, that there is a sin debt, a sacrifice is owed, but God will provide it. And God didn't just provide it for Abraham in, in, in that goat in the bushes, right? He's going to provide it for all of humanity, for all who want a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what's revealed in this story. So that's why God is a God of grace, a God of the promise, and a God of justice and holiness. He requires justice. He requires a sacrifice. But because of his grace and mercy and forgiveness, he himself provides it in his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that, though Abraham, of course, didn't know about Jesus at that time, I'm sure he knew God was up to something. That God is up to something. And I'm sure Abraham, now in glory, now knows, I know that you love me, and that because you didn't withhold your one and only son from me. And now we can say the same thing. We can know God loves us, that he is the provider God to us, because he gives up his son on the cross for us. And so all of us get tested, and maybe you're in a time of testing right now, where God has really put his influence and his hands on a specific area in your life, and you're really feeling it, and it feels cruel. It's difficult getting your faith refined, but know that God loves you, and that God is doing it, because salvation is found only in him, not in the false foundations, not in any of the other things that we found, find our salvation or security or significance. God's plan is not to harm you. God's plan is not to make you live a sacrificial life, giving up everything in your life, but to bring you to a place of blessing. A place of blessing with him. God's purpose in testing you is to reveal himself to you, to change you, to transform you. And it's easy to question his love and goodness during these hard times. But you can be encouraged through this story. Because it points you to the Father who sacrificed his own son for you to save you. You can look at the cross, right? And you can say, now I know, God, that you love me. Because you did not withhold your one and only son from me. Let's pray before our final time of praise.
Lord, we thank you for what you revealed to Abraham. Lord, we all have false foundations. Lord, humanity is constantly looking to other things to save ourselves. Lord, maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our work. Maybe it's money, God. Whatever it is, we always look to these things. And God, we thank you that you are working to take us off of them and onto you. Lord, you are the tree of life. To be in your presence, to be in a relationship with you, Lord, is to have eternal life. We thank you, God, that you test us so that we can be saved. Lord, so that we can be purified, so that we can be refined. Lord, for everyone who is going through trials right now, who is going through testing, that they would rest assured, that they would be confident that you love them. Lord, that you are doing this for their benefit. That you are the God who provided the sacrifice. That you are the God who provided your one and only Son so that we could be blessed, so that we could have eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with us as we praise our great God together.